Welcome, my name is Miglena Comforti and I am a practicing breast pathologist at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm going to present two cases of mammary myofibroblastomas today. Myofibroblastomas, as the name implies, are composed of myofibroblasts. They're benign neoplasms. The term myofibroblastoma was first coined in 1987, and early on we thought that these are lesions that are predominantly localized to the groin or inguinal area in men. However, since then we've come to also realize that women can be affected as well, and that other anatomic sites, such as the vulva, the scrotum, the trunk, the breast, may similarly present with myofibroblastomas. Most commonly, patients are in their 50s or 60s when they're diagnosed with myofibroblastoma. However, a wide age range of presentation has been documented. Clinically, these lesions are usually solitary, they're well circumscribed, they may be firm, but they're usually mobile. Radiographically, the cut surfaces are homogeneous, hypoechoic, and multilobate. As such, it is no surprise that clinically, most commonly, the differential diagnosis is rule out fibroadenoma. The first case I will present is a 40-year-old female who presented with the clinical differential diagnosis of rule-out fiber adenoma. She had a 2.1 centimeter mass in her left breast. You can see multiple corneal fragments of breast tissue here, which are breast epithelial elements, stroma, as well as adipose tissue. In some of these areas, you probably appreciate the classic histomorphologic findings of pseudoangiomata stromal hyperplasia and please note the presence of epithelial elements. In other areas of this corneal biopsy, we see different findings. We see a spindle cell proliferation growing in short fascicles, which is devoid of epithelial elements. And this is a way to differentiate myofibroblastoma of the breast and PASH. What we do appreciate is the presence of a lipomatous component. We see adipocytes, and this can be variably present within myofibroblastomas. At intermediate to high power, we see that the cells are indeed spindle, but somewhat plump. And some of them start demonstrating pseudo-inclusions, small nucleoli, or even grooves in the nuclei. The cytoplasm here is amphophilic, but in some other areas can be actually quite eosinophilic and myoid-like, and the cell borders are indistinct. As such, you may start considering smooth muscle tumors in your differential diagnosis, and given the variable proportion of the lipomatous component in this tumor, you also may start considering fatty tumors. Other things to think about, in addition to myofibroblastoma, are neural tumors and even carcinoma. So let's look at the immunoprofile. The first stain is CD34. This stain will react in fibroblasts of the breast, and here we see this proliferation of cells is nicely reactive with it. The second stain with very similar distribution is desmin. This is a stain that is reactive in smooth muscle cells. But you should not be surprised that there is a concomitant CD34 and desmin expression, because as the name implies, these cells are myofibroblasts, and they can have variable differentiation along the spectrum between fibroblasts and smooth muscle cells. The third stain to do is estrogen receptor, or ER. This has nuclear reactivity, as we see right here, and is a potential pitfall in your diagnosis, especially in myofibroblastomas that are more epithelioid and have pseudo-single cell growth pattern. You should be mindful not to diagnose the diagnosis of invasive lobular carcinoma in such cases. The second case is in an elderly gentleman who presented with this right breast lesion, three centimeters in greatest dimension, which was there for quite some time. This lesion didn't really bother him until he experienced trauma to the breast. The lesion enlarged and became somewhat tender. So he underwent a corneal biopsy. Similar to what we saw in the first patient, we have spindle cell proliferation of cells that are, again, spindled, but somewhat plump and maybe even epithelioid in some areas, amphophilic cytoplasm, and really low-grade cytologic atypia. Note the entrapped, dense collagen-like fibers in the background. What we don't see is high-grade cytologic atypia, necrosis, or very conspicuous and increased mitotic figures. So let's take a look again at the immunoprofile. 
The first stain is CD34, diffusely reactive within this lesion. The second stain is Desmin, with very similar distribution in its reactivity as well as intensity. And remember, the third stain to do is estrogen receptor, very nicely reactive within these nuclei. The majority of myofibroblastomas will have Desmin and CD34 expression, like I mentioned earlier, but there is a small proportion that will have negative CD34 and Desmin expression. That should not preclude you from making the diagnosis of myofibroblastoma, especially in a case with classic morphology. However, if you would like to, you could investigate further and do additional studies. You could evaluate the presence of retinoblastoma tumor suppressor gene, or RB. In myofibroblastomas, it tends to be lost, so you could do immunohistochemistry for RB1 and look for that absence. You could also uh, send this material for fluorescence in situ hybridization or FISH, which will show the loss of 13Q14, or the retinoblastoma locus, in about 80% of these cases. However, be mindful that the loss of RB is not entirely diagnostic for myofibroblastoma, as it can be seen in other tumors. This is the excision specimen of the second patient. And myofibrillosomas are managed surgically, and basically an excision is curative. We can see as clinically and radiographically described that this indeed is a solitary lesion that is very well circumscribed. There are no infiltrative, uh, infiltrative cells here into the surrounding breast parenchyma. There's really no capsule, but rather the suggestion of a pseudo capsule. And again, the cut surfaces are very homogeneous, multilobate, composed of the same spindle cells that we saw earlier. Recurrence rates are low to none, and there's no evidence that even in the case of positive margins, there is increased risk of recurrence for these patients. And with that, I'd like to end the presentation. Thank you.